Let's pray. Father, we love you. We love you. And we are so glad that you see us, know us, love us, even when we struggle to see you. And we pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll fill your people scattered and gathered this morning, gathered by you, even though we are in different homes, gathered by your spirit to you and to one another. We pray that you will open our eyes to see our Lord Jesus, bend our wills to serve him and ignite our hearts to love him. And all in his mighty name, we ask these things. Amen. 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 Good morning. We are in, um, we're continuing in the book of 2 Corinthians, in case you, um, you didn't know, or I haven't said it recently, we're going to be ta- pray, um, uh, proclaiming 2 Corinthians all the way through. So we'll be reading every part of this letter. We won't be preaching on every verse, but we'll be reading and proclaiming every verse and then preaching on every section. This morning, we're in 2 Corinthians, and it's chapter, uh, chapter 1, beginning at verse 15. Uh, if you have your Bible with you, and we have a lot of folks who may not be uh, from all that familiar with where 2 Corinthians is. And so if you were to open your Bible right smack in the middle, you'd probably find Psalms. Now, first 2 Corinthians then is going to be to your right, kind of way over on the end. So flip to the left, flip, 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 and all the prophets. Uh, you might get to the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, keep going. Yeah, Acts, keep going. Romans, almost there. And then first and Second Corinthians. So if you go to First Corinthians, or sorry, sorry, Second Corinthians, and the first chapter, and in the fifteenth verse, that's where we'll begin. <clears throat> so, when growing up, my kids did not have um, utterly consistent parents, uh, and so every once in a while we would hear, "But you said," and um, sometimes they were right. Sometimes uh, we we spaced, or we we're kind of being squirrely. Sometimes uh, there was a good reason for um, not uh, doing what we said. Sometimes they heard what they wanted to hear, and it wasn't actually what we said. Um, But this is a naturally human instinct. We want uh, want folks to be consistent as we grow and and work in the workplace. We look for consistency in folks we work with, and especially to those folks to whom um, we are responsible. And so we're always looking for for consistency. And and when it doesn't happen, we kind of, it's easy to fall into but you said, and uh, it happens, I know this is hard to believe, but this also happens in the church. Um, we have these odd situations where um, misunderstandings can happen. I, I tell people, probably not frequently enough, but I tell people that when I mess something up, please make your first instinct not to assume maliciousness, but to assume incompetence, right? Assume that I've just done it badly um, or, or made a mistake. It's not that I'm above being mean. I can, I mean, I'm human too, right? I can be surly. But most of the time, I'm, I'm really not. Most of the time, I'm just incompetent. So if you'll just give me that benefit of a doubt, I would be very grateful for that. Um, amen, right? And the church is full of, um, is full of these, this situation. We're a church full of uh, sinners and, and hypocrites. Uh, I always find it a little interesting when one of the knocks against the church is that it's full of hypocrites. Well, yeah. We're full of human beings, as we're full of sinners and hypocrites. We are on our way to being made more like Christ, to be sure, and there's always growth in this area. Uh, But sure enough, it is a church full of imperfect people. The water's fine. Come on in. And so we have this situation somewhat in Paul's letter this morning. It's it's both that simple, but it is also much more profound. Paul has said, just in the beginning of this letter, he said how much he loves them and how he wanted to visit them full of confidence that they would be, that they would be kind of back together again, be in the right place. If you remember the, the first letter of, of, of 1 Corinthians, there was a lot of division, there was a lot of politics, there was a lot of posturing going on. But it would appear that since that letter, there came a time when they were more together and on the right page, and Paul was going to visit them full of the expectation. He says, we are each other's glory, right? The fact that we love one another, that we care for one another, that we sacrifice for one another. This is our, this is our glory. This is, this is what is real. This is what is projected into the world from who we are, is this great and wonderful glory of God. Well, it would appear that something has gone sideways. Uh, Paul evidently couldn't keep a promise. He thought that he was going to come from possibly Ephesus, but he thought he was going to go to Macedonia, come and stop in Corinth, spend some time with these people he loves, go to Macedonia, come back from Macedonia and stop in Corinth again with these people he loves and then move on. But plans uh, have changed. And it would appear that either um, 
the church overall or some factions within the church. And again, if we go back to 1 Corinthians, that first letter, we know that there were some factions in the church. That somebody has raised up a stir and said, Paul, you're unreliable. Um, you, we can't count on you. You're not keeping your word. You said you were going to be here twice. Now you're only going to be here once. And this is where we come in on verse 15. He, Paul says, because I was sure of this, because I was sure of that initial first place of, of union and reunion and reconciliation. Because of that, I wanted to come to you first so we could have a second experience of grace. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia, back from Macedonia again to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh? So it seems like he's responding to something. We're coming into a conversation where we only hear one side of the conversation. But it would appear that somebody is on the other side of the conversation saying, Paul, you're, um, you're just a flake. You can't really be counted on to keep your word. And Paul says, no, no, no. Uh, do I make plans according to the flesh to say yes, yes, and no, no at the same time? He says, no. As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. He says that um, I wasn't vacillating. I was, I was actually stable with you. There were legitimate reasons for not keeping my word. Don't doubt me. Don't, don't project on me the fact that I might be malicious in any way towards you. And then he does what he does uh, throughout these letters. He takes the mundane things of life. And this is the Christian life, actually. He takes the mundane things of life, and he works, he moves into talking about God. He can't seem to help himself. He can't seem to help himself. It seems like everything that he sees in front of him reminds of God and his work in Jesus, God's goodness his, and his mercy and his hard work and what he's done in Jesus. So he immediately seems to head over to having talked about his own reliability to the reliability of God. I love this. You, you never know when he's going to pull this. It happens all the time. It, he seems to live in this, what's often called a one-story world where our lives and God's movement is all of a piece and is happening all the time. And he recognizes this. He sees the things going on in the world, and he realizes that this is God at work, or it has something to say about God at work. And so he riffs over into this, right from saying, I am reliable. He says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who we proclaimed among you, Sylvanius, Timothy, and I, team ministry going on there, um, was not yes and no, but in him it is always yes. Hmm. He's, in, he's instantly, Paul, kind of raised the bar on this letter. He has gone from talking about what's going on just between he and the church at Corinth now to talking what's going on between he and Corinth and God himself. It's amazing. He instantly goes from our squabbles to God. This is a wonderful move and a move that Christians, um, we learn to make more and more. It's a move that our Rwandan brothers and sisters make easily, much more easily than we do, frankly. Something comes up and they instantly move to prayer. I get up in the morning. It's a beautiful morning. It is a beautiful morning. Praise God for the beautiful morning. Let's pray. Okay. <laughs> um, we're going to go take a trip. Everybody in the car. Everybody in the car. Good. Yes, we're taking a trip. Trips can be dangerous. Let's pray. So it's just a constant reflex to integrate God's power and glory and personality with what's going on in our lives. And I love it. I would like to have more of it myself. He says that um, we, when we proclaim, it was not yes and no, but in him, it is always Yes. So all of a sudden, Paul is raising our eyes from the squabbles between he and Corinth to what is true of God. For the promises of God find their yes in him. God's desires, God's promises, all through the Old, the Old Testament scriptures of, of regeneration, of renewal, of resurrection, of coming back from exile, they have become true in Jesus. They have become all focused in Jesus and can be seen and known in Jesus. It's astounding. The fullness of his promises are in Jesus. The goodness of his promises are in Jesus. The resolution of his promises are in Jesus. To break the power of death and sin happened because of Jesus and his work on the cross. To then fill us with his spirit happened because of Jesus' death. We don't know quite what the mechanism was, but Jesus said himself, until he goes, the spirit cannot come fully. The spirit that we heard about in Ezekiel that filled people and changed our hearts. The spirit that we heard about in Joel. The spirit that we knew at Pentecost. All this very spirit, this very promise of God came true because in some way, Jesus went to the cross and the spirit was then released. So all the fullness of God, all his promises, get yes in Jesus. You see Jesus and you hear yes. You li listen to Jesus and you hear yes. You pray to Jesus and you hear yes. You hear the Father saying yes. 
It is full and rich and deep in this man, Jesus, whom I love and who is my son, the scriptures right here say, and whom I sent to give you my promises and to fulfill my promises amongst you and to enable you even to fulfill your promises to me, God says. And it's amazing. And so God, Paul says, then in verse 20, that is why through him we utter our amen to God for his glory. We say amen just means so be it, or may it be so, or yes. So Paul says, to God, yes, we say yes. If that's what you're up to, if that's your promises, you say yes, we say yes in return. And there may be a liturgical or a worship reference here. That's it's up to, for debate. But um, for sure, for sure, much of worship, much of worship is simply this. It is hearing God yes to us in Jesus and us saying, oh, yes, in return. If those are the promises, I am in. If that's what you're offering, I am in. If that's what you're about, I am in. Yes, nothing else is working. Nothing else is working. I'm in. Yes, yes. And then Paul, Paul takes it even deeper. And he says, if that's the deal, then get this. It is God who establishes us with you. So now he comes back down to the ground level, us into the Corinthians together, who, who are a bit messy at the moment. He establishes us together in the Messiah. So that is to say that God has brought us to, to belong to the Messiah. Uh, we are guaranteed that we are his. We are guaranteed that he claims us. We are guaranteed that we are part of his work and his love and, and his power. I love this. I lose track. And before I was a Christian, I had no clue. I was like, I was like one of those windmills that spin around in every direction. I had no idea who I was established with, by, who, or for. No idea. The wind would change, an opinion would change, anything would change, and all of a sudden I'm spinning. But God, uh, Paul says that God, the Father's taken us, and he said, all right, stop the spinning. You are established in my Christ. You are settled here. You belong to him. He loves you. You are his. J.I. Packer, uh, the great theologian, of all the images of God, he's only written like, I don't know, 10 gazillion books. And so, but and he's got more between his ears than most people in, 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 in any given room. But of all the images, he says, that he loves of God and of the atonement, that is to say what Christ did on the cross. What was the, of all the things this great mind could think of, what's the image that he loved the best? Adoption. Adoption. So in our membership class, adoption is the very first thing we start with. And it is the basis for talking about church membership. In our baptism class, adoption is the first and foundational thing that we talk about by way of baptism. It is adoption that becomes this overriding image. It's not the only image in scripture to be sure, but isn't it glorious? And how established is an adopted child? Now they may feel not very established, but from the person adopting them, they are in. In this room, Mark Summers has an adopted son. And he's, by, according to Mark, his son is in. He is, is his son, period, paragraph, end of story. It's done. And when God signs the adoption papers on us, we belong to that family. We are in, period, paragraph, end of story. And we're given then the family resemblance to change us from the inside out, not to change our personalities. Our personalities are beautiful and good but to bring these sort of twisted and messed up personalities in line with God's own personality so that they're expressed in their best and most beautiful ways. We are established. He establishes us in his Messiah. And he anoints us. Another great word. Indeed, God, throughout the scriptures, anointing has lots of purposes, but certainly it typically has. It shows up on kings and priests and prophets, and it typically means someone who is set aside, visibly set aside, and commissioned for a work. And Paul says that we are anointed. We are assorted. We are, we are given this sign. Again, this may be a baptismal reference. Hard to tell, but it may well be. But that we are for sure, we are anointed by God. We are given this sign, set aside as his own, and commissioned for his work. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? So Paul, all of a sudden, has gone from the squabbles of Corinth to talk about what God has done in all his people by way of healing them. So they're anointed. God has personally empowered and commissioned us as his people for his particular plans. Now that doesn't mean that we all have to become missionaries or ordained people or anything. It simply means that all our plans now come to be part of God's plans. 
And then his plans work throughout the world, in every relationship, in every uh, piece of work, everywhere we go. He is always at work. And now our plans become a part of his plans. We're commissioned to be working on his behalf, and he will use us. He will empower us. We're also sealed. Paul kind of, sometimes Paul gets going, right? He can't stop just one word, two words. There's a third one. We are sealed. He's given us an identifying mark that we belong to Jesus. An identifying mark that displays that we are, as opposed to anybody else's, Jesus's. That we are God's. He will later identify this very partic particularly as the Spirit. But the, the, the people then, if you're adopted and you're given a new family resemblance, then that family resemblance is going to show up as distinct from other family resemblances. We'll talk about that in just a minute. He also then has given us his spirit and our hearts as a guarantee. This word means like, like, like pledge, like down payment, uh, like the promise of, of God, of the new creation, uh, heaven, if you will. That time when, when somehow, somehow, somehow evil is done with and the goodness of God remains. And it's not just the remnant of his goodness. It's actually the expansion and even the greater fullness of his goodness that is brought to bear. We've said it before, that more was gained at the resurrection than was lost at the fall. And so we are headed for a place that looks even greater than we can imagine. And his spirit, so God has given... And it's crazy, I know. And I know we know this, but we keep needing to hear it. God has given us his very spirit, his very personality. He's established us and then said, here, part of me, I'm going to fill you with. My very self. You're not just hearing about me anymore. You're not just following the rules, as important as that is anymore. You're not just doing uh, the temple sacrifices, as important as those are anymore. All of that now is actually encompassed by being filled with his very reality, his very spirit, his very personality, his very strength, in from the inside out. Again, uh, Joel says it's going to pour down on everybody. Joel's great. Uh, the Old Testament egalitarian. Everybody gets the spirit. Men, women, children, slaves, big shots, low shots. Everybody gets the spirit, which means that everybody then stands on equal ground before the cross. Amen? Yes. Amen. Ezekiel says he'll take out our heart of stone and give us a heart of flesh by his spirit. Nicodemus comes and he says, and Jesus, this is awesome when Jesus does this, right? Normal setting, and Jesus, like Paul, hmm, where do you think Paul got this? Anyway, Jesus takes a normal conversation and instantly raises the level of the conversation. You have to be born again. I have to do what? You have to be born from above, actually, the text says. And the spirit blows where it will, which is to say it will give you new life. Spirit, wind, new life. Genesis 2. Different sermon, but just think about it. So we're at this place where then he has given us the spirit. We experience God's real presence today, his actual personal presence today in some way as a down payment for when we, when we experience it so fully, beautifully, perfectly, Oh, God, please, healed and restored someday. But we get some of it today. So it's this down payment. It's partly some of the stuff from the future, right? And it's also then the promise of the whole thing to come. And that is given to us today as believers. This is put in our hearts. Again, it's God's work. We don't get to make this up. We don't get to say, there's no self-help book that says the 10 easy steps to make God put his presence in your heart. The book doesn't exist, but the Bible says that this is indeed what God wants to do and what he will do. It is given in our very being, our heart, our mind, our bodies, and our will, his reality, his personal presence for us, even in these days, and even as we, pro as we proceed into the next days. So if we are established, it's worth remembering that we are established. We forget who we belong to. I belong to Fox News. I belong to MSNBC. I belong to uh, my favorite preacher. I belong to my favorite book. I belong to whoever. You don't belong to them as much as you belong to Jesus. There's no way. Not if you're established in Christ. You belong to Jesus first and foremost and always. Always. And first, of all, remember that you are established, that you are set in a solid place with a God that loves you. Just remember that part. And everything else can then be dealt with. 
Anything else can then be dealt with from that place of being established. This is my great prayer for my kids. Uh, I told the joke, right, that uh, as I got older, I had a little bit of money. I said, you got a little bit of money. You can do two things with it. You can get therapy, because I'm, th I'm sure I messed you up, um, or you can go to college. I would recommend going to college because then you can pay for your own therapy. Um, yeah. but, um, but either way, right? But God has, but, but my prayer would be, if you, were, if you are established and you know who you are as a child of God and in Jesus, then you can take on anything, right? Then you can navigate whatever comes your way. We are established in Jesus. So remember that. Be grateful that you're anointed. What a deal. This king of the universe has set you personally aside as his person and for his work. This is amazing. On my own, I'm the biggest dud ever. I'm, a, I'm terrible. I'm in the weeds. I'm a waste. I have no clue. I'm causing harm right and left. So God has taken that bare material and said, how about I establish you in Christ, in my son? How about I anoint you? And how about I give you some work to do? Uh, again, I'll take it. If that's what's on offer, I'm in. I don't care what the work is. Make it important, make it unimportant. I don't care. If you'll give me work to do, I'm in. Accept that you are sealed. You will look and feel and act differently. You will. And it'll be noticed. You need to accept the fact that you are sealed, that you have the imprint of Christ on you. Now then, this doesn't mean um, that there are not uh, people uh, who are utterly different. Everybody's utterly different. There are no good or kind non-Christian people. Of course there are. But you will stand out as belonging particularly to Jesus. You will stand out as belonging particularly to Jesus so that your life will spread something of Jesus himself in other lives. And the other thing is good. It's good to be made in his image. And that when that comes to the fore in ways of goodness and kindness and nobility, just naturally, this is a good thing. But you belong to Jesus. And so your goodness and kindness and nobility will shed forth his name and his very presence. Accept that you are sealed. You are not the same as everybody else, even if you are the same in many ways. You are a presence of Christ. That's not to be arrogant. That's not to be a jerk. Um, none of that is the right of a person who's sealed. But we have to accept that we will look and sound like Jesus as we grow in him. And that it will be noticed sometimes for the good and with gratitude, and sometimes not for the good and not so well received. And then we receive the down payment of the Spirit. Receive is the key word when talking about the Holy Spirit. It's not grasp, it's not figure out, it's not get your head around, it's receive. It's a, it's a verb, it's an active verb where we open ourselves to the Holy Spirit. We say, all right, Holy Spirit, you, you were given to us at our baptism, the scriptures say, when we become Christians, the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit lives within us, but I would like for it to keep going. I would like more. Show me how to participate with you, Spirit, so that I experience you more fully, so that I'm the kind of person, the kind of temple, Paul will say, that you will fill more and more, that you will, uh, I think it's Galatians, it's even a command to be filled more and more with the Holy Spirit. So there's something active where we turn towards God, the Holy Spirit. We ask for him to receive him. We make ourselves as, as in sync with God's personality as possible so that it's as easy as possible to be filled with him. And then we receive this filling of the Spirit. It's quite amazing. And it changes everything. Or at least it can change parts of everything. There may be some things that are not fully redeemed until all things are redeemed. But there's nothing that is beyond God's reach. He's not saying, oh, man, that person, that relationship, that situation, I can't touch that one until the last day. It may not be fully redeemed until the last day. But in every situation, there's something that the Spirit can touch and begin to redeem, however small. So after taking us and sort of flying around in the high air with God and his power and established with Christ and anointed and given his Spirit and sealed by him, Paul brings it back down to earth for the Corinthians in verse 23. But I call God to witness against me. It was to spare you that I refrained from coming again to Corinth. Not that we lord it over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, for your joy, for you to stand firm. So I made up my mind not to make another painful visit to you. 
I love this. This is real. And this is keeping it real. I can't do it again. I can't do it again. I can't come and do the pain again. Because if I cause you pain, who's going to make me glad? If I set you, if I set you away from me, who's going to come for me? If I reject you, who will accept me? And this is keeping it real. I know this happens in families, in church families, all over the place. There is a word or a situation that's hard, and it needs to be said, and it needs to be heard, but it is painful. How do we do that? But, and we need one another's love. We need one another's presence. How do we bring the hard word into that without me sending you away when I desperately need you? And yet the word still needs to be said. Now we go back to the middle part of the letter. Only people, I will offer this, really only people who are established in Christ, anointed, sealed, and have received the down payment are able to do this, are able to stay with one another in fear and trembling, in a word said, maybe even imperfectly, and yet still keeping it real. We need one another. We're desperate for one another. And yet the Holy Spirit will always be forming us, reforming us, strengthening us. And this may include hard words. I love Paul's tenderness here. I love it. He's so vulnerable. He's saying, look, we got things to talk about. Things aren't right. But holy mud, if I send you away, who do I have? The rest of the letter will deal with much of how this works out, how the very power of God amongst the people of God, established, anointed, sealed, and receiving the, the down payment of God can make the kingdom of God work in daily life. Because that's all we got, folks. The Christian life is the daily life. And the kingdom of God must permeate that daily life. It must. In all of its weirdness, and all of its fluctuation, and in all of its beauty, It must permeate the daily life. And much of this letter then is discussing how that pans out. So we have the very glory of God rooted in the mundane, prosaic life of of the people of God, again, sent up to God to, to receive us and sent back down for our work in his life. We are the people of God. This is the kingdom of God. I know it doesn't look much like it, but that is the truth. It is the Holy Spirit that fills us and makes this life more than just the living of it. God brings us into himself and fills it with his presence. And we are included. We are adopted. We are his. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we love you. We love you. Uh, We realize that we can't make this up. (laughs) We we can't do it on our own. Every time we try, we're out in the weeds. Uh, Every time we do, we get it wrong. But you came from the Father. By your death and release of the Spirit, have opened up a whole new life for us a whole new life in the midst permeating this life. Open our eyes to see that. Make us grateful for it, Lord. Help us to remember to whom we belong. And may we receive you and your spirit more and more all the time. And we know that you will honor your promises to indeed give your spirit. And we're counting on it. And we love you. In Christ's name, amen.